Okay. How's it going, everybody? Uh, I don't know if anyone is on yet. Hopefully, hopefully there'll be some sort of audience. Are you on it? Yeah. Okay. Um... Okay, so you're the first one. Gotcha. I don't have uh, I don't have anybody on yet. Want to share it to the? All right. So I guess I'm gonna start. So uh, how's it going? Uh, tonight I am doing the Hitchhiker's Guide to Fly Tying Part Three, uh, which is going to be material uh, material selection and learning how to substitute materials um so in the beginning of uh learning how to tie flies when i would go into a fly shop uh a lot of times um you know you would see guys struggle with what they want to get uh and i remember specifically my experience of it in the very beginning um just like I was talking about with all the other things, like the threads, uh, there is uh, aisles and aisles of materials. Uh, you don't even know where to start or what really belongs to um, what type of fly and whatnot. So um, it could be pretty overwhelming for a lot of people, especially beginners, uh, where they have no idea what the hell uh, to pick. Uh, so I'm going to go over some common materials, especially ones that I would really pick up uh, in the beginning that will get you going. Uh, the first thing I would probably decide, which I was mentioning in my other videos, is uh, figure out if you're tying dry flies or nymphs uh, first. So again, dry, dry flies are going to be the flies that float on top of the water, and the nymphs are going to be, uh, the, nymphs are going to be the little guys that go under the water. All right? So once you decide whether it's dry flies or uh, nymphs, um, that's where I would kind of use as a jumping off point to go find the materials for it. So the best thing you could do is, uh, and this is recommended by a lot of people, which is true, uh, one approach to uh, purchasing materials in the very beginning is really um, you want to find a few patterns that you're interested first uh and then what you're going to do is is pick those and you're going to source the materials for those specific patterns uh trying to buy uh all materials that you possibly can all at once in the very beginning uh one you're going to run your ass broke real quick uh because it's a black hole uh and Two, you're you're probably going to have a bunch of materials that you don't even know what to do with yet. Uh, I found myself, you know, two years later finding shit in uh, in my drawers that I I didn't even touch yet. It's been sitting in there, and then you finally are starting to use them. So a good way to not really go too nuts in the early parts of fly tying is. Uh, try to narrow it down to a few patterns that you're really, really interested in, uh, and that you're going to fish. Uh, you got to remember, don't, don't, don't just find flies that are pretty to you in the book or, or whatever you're looking at and pick those materials just because you think they're pretty. If you're starting off fly tying, you also want to be tying the flies that you're hopefully going to be putting in the water. Uh, so when you're looking through that stuff and you're, you might have flies that you think are pretty and, and nice looking, um, but they might completely be out of a range of, of, uh, skill sets that you might have in the early stages. And it's going to make things really even more difficult that you're biting off more than you can chew. Uh, so I would really find out what flies that you want to fish uh, and also, uh, what the skill level looks like, uh, to you and then source the materials and, and go find it. Um, so the first material that I went over in the first video was thread. Um, and then, uh, so I'm going to go down a list of other materials that are pretty good to start off with from the very beginning. Uh, so, uh, you're going to find beads. Uh, I, I touched on that on the last video. 
Uh, beads come in all different uh, sizes and 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 uh, material as well. Uh, tungsten beads are heavy. They're weighted. They're they're heavier than lead. Uh, tungsten beads are meant to get the fly down uh, fast. Uh, they're used a lot in Euro nymphs, and that is so. Uh, what a uh, what are Euro nymphs? Uh, they are Euro nymphing is a type of fly fishing uh, that has a slightly different style. Uh, and instead of adding weight to your line, uh, you would be adding weight into the actual build of the fly. Uh, and that gets the fly down into the strike zone of where the fish are. So uh, in that case, uh, tungsten is a very common material that's used in um, Euro nymphs uh, because of the, that style of fishing. Uh, so if you don't need to get tungsten, uh, tungsten is expensive. Uh, it, it, it is not cheap. Uh, and you're not going to get many tungsten beads in a pack for... Uh, for what you're paying. I mean, you, you'd be coughing up seven, eight dollars for, you know, you're lucky if you get 15 or 20 beads, depending on the company. So uh, in the very beginning, I'd probably stay away from tungsten for a little bit until you know what the hell you're using them for. Um, and in that case, I would get, uh, you know, very uh, Cyclops beads. Those guys do you just well. Uh, I use, still use them for a ton of stuff, and like I said, if if you don't really need the weight, you could always add the weight with with the split shots and stuff if you're nymphing. So beads, uh, there's a bunch of different ones. Some are made of brass. Um, it, some guys use glass beads, which are something you could pick up in a in a craft store. Um, check glass beads. Um, they're fragile. They are glass. So keep in mind that you might tie a nice fly, you you know, you roll cast forward and that fly goes, you know, uh, rolling out and it smacks a rock. It could shatter the bead and then you're left with, um, uh, you know, three quarters of a fly. So the glass beads, they're, they're cheap. You get a shit ton of them, but they are glass and they're fragile. And if they hit hard objects, they will... They will crack and shatter. So it's totally up to you on that one. I think they're useful for what they are. If you are low uh, on on money and, and that's really the, the best that you can afford, um, it's better to get those and to just start tying than to count yourself out because you can't get fancy schmancy stuff like tungsten. So it, you make do with whatever is is appropriate for your budget and there's always later. Um, but glass beads are also used. And again, you could get them at craft stores like a uh, Hobby Lobby, Michaels. Uh, they're, they're pretty good. And they come in a, in an insane amount of colors. You could go ape shit with the colors. Size selection, not so much. That's a little tight. Hey, John, what's going on? Hope you're, uh, hope you're doing well. Um, so the glass beads, uh, they, they do have their place. And again, the colors, you really, they have a, a really wide selection of colors at craft stores, uh, for this stuff. So glass beads are an option for you. Uh, they will not get you the weight. Uh, so it's not going to get the fly down, uh, quick. Um, but like I said, that's okay. You could always add weight to your line if, if you want to, it's, it's okay. Uh, you could even do, if you really want to, you could even do a little lead wire wraps up the body before you even tie the fly. And there's your weight too. So there's a lot of ways around it. Um, so moving on from beads, I'm going to be, uh, I'll show you, uh, a pretty common thing that people get introduced to very early on. They don't really know what the hell it is. Uh, and this is for uh mostly uh, dry flies but it's uh it's hackle and this helps the flies float above water and it gives a really buggy appearance and it's wrapped around the it's wrapped around the collar like that you see the you see it up there so that's that's the hackle that's wrapped around that front collar um there are many different grades of this stuff it's not cheap um there's different sizes, uh, but Whiting Farms is going to be probably your best bet when it comes to saddle hackles. Uh, they make a lot of different, they have a lot of different types of feathers, but when it comes to this for dry flies, uh, it is the most dense when it comes to barbs. What I mean by barbs is like a, when I fan them out, 
those are barbs. So very dense, uh, gives a very full appearance when you when you wrap it around the fly. Um, and Whiting Farms, the cool thing about this, and I was talking to a guy online, uh, I think it was earlier today about this. He was asking questions about uh, what one does he need to get because they're expensive. Um, Whiting Farms makes a introductory pack of four half capes. That's a half cape because it's, it's cut in half. Um, they make a pack of four and it comes in a cream and a gray, uh, grizzly, which is the white and blacks, uh, uh, alternating, uh, pattern on them. And, um, uh, and this, uh, this rust red the, and I think that there's another selection too for a different set of colors, but it's 66 bucks and you have four half capes. That's going to give you a shit ton of material for quite a long time. And it's going to give you different sizes. So, you know, when it comes to the size of the hackle is appropriate to the size of the hook, you're going to use those little guys that are down here um, for really small flies. And as you tie larger flies, you start to move towards the back of the cape and you could be using much larger ones. Now, these really big ones, I'll show you, that are usually towards the back and up top. Um, those are used, you could use those for, um, lateral lines on streamers. You'll see those a lot on really big flies and they're, they're usually, they do them on each side of the fly and it gives this really nice kind of lateral line. Um, and when you see it in the water, it kind of does this, this shimmering dance kind of thing and it does drive the fish wild. So it, it is useful for all sorts of things. It is not just for dry flies. Um, but primarily the smaller ones is, is that's, that's the material that you're going to be sourcing from is, is this. So hackles, uh, they also make a thing called a hackle gauge and it helps in the very beginning. And I'm going to see if I could find mine that I don't use much anymore. I also have one built into the desk. I have no idea where it is. Um, so the hackle gauge is, it's a small, it's a small, um, it's sometimes it's on wood, sometimes it's on uh, plastic, but it's all it is is a is a is a metal post that sticks out, and you're gonna see these uh, these arcs that kind of look like a rainbow, and each one will be numbered uh, accordingly, so that will show you uh, the different sizes to the barb. So when I say barb again, that's that's this stuff. And each one measures out to one of those radiuses, and it'll tell you if it fits a size 16 hook, a size 14 hook. So in the beginning, when you don't really know how they um, fit, and you're not really sure what size, the hackle gauge is really good to have uh, early on uh, so that you are teaching yourself what size hackle is appropriate for the size hook that you're doing. Uh, why is it important? Uh, if you put a hackle that's not really the appropriate uh, size to the hook, uh, number one, it's going to be disproportionate. Um, it's kind of an eyesore as soon as you see it, you know it don't look right. Um, so the barbs, when they fan around, when they fan around the hook, you're going to have them you're going to have the barbs just slightly past the hook point, um, but you're not really going anything too crazy larger than that. And you're not going to go too tiny either because what happens is, is the fly doesn't sit right on the water. Uh, and again, this is about dry flies, the guys that float on top. The fly is not going to sit right. It's going to kind of sit cockeyed if the if the hackle is not really on the, the appropriate size to the hook. So the, that's another reason why you want to make sure that you're using a size that, that's appropriate to that size hook because you want the the fly to sit properly as well. It's used as a support system. I mean, that's, that's what the hackle does. It, it makes the fly stay above the water. Those tiny little barbs and stuff like that, when they when they sit on like that, it keeps the fly off the water. Um, so, if you are able to pick up a, a a hackle gauge when you're starting off, they're only a few bucks, but they will definitely 
they will definitely help train your eyes. And then after a while, if you've been doing it a while, when you look at the the barbs uh, and you know the pieces when you're selecting them, you just know. Uh, and you really find yourself using it less and less, but it's a great tool. It's a useful tool. So in the beginning, when you're when you're picking out your your first few hackle uh, saddles, uh, pick up the the hackle gauge too because it is really it helps you. Um, any questions about any th questions about these feathers? And I'll start to move on to something else. Anyone kind of still unclear about what I'm talking about? Is anyone like what the hell? the hell is that <laughs> is everyone good on it as i'll talk about it more I'll also sh i'll show you real quick what other ones look like um so when i was talking about like grizzly uh grizzly is like a it's a black and white um that's used in a lot of traditional dry fly patterns you'll see that a lot but uh and a great thing about this is if you get into dyeing you could dye this whatever color you want as well so the white becomes something else you could do like a black and chartreuse it's kind of cool. So uh, grizzly hackle is really good to have. Uh, I always like a good rust. Um, you're also going to find stuff like this. This is also pretty cool. Um, you could use those for like March browns and things like that. And then you're also going to have like a – there's a cream color. Uh, comes in handy. And uh, there's also a dun color. I mentioned this in the last video. Dun is like a gray. It's – also found in a lot of bugs. So it is good to have, I would say, critically, those colors are probably really what you want out of your first four uh, when you start. And it comes in a pack with all four of them, so it's perfect. So I would definitely recommend uh, checking out Whiting Farms uh, for the introductory pack. Um, so moving on from Hackle, you're going to see, uh, we're going to start moving into the, the, nymph, the, the nymphs again. Uh, not that it's exclusively used for nymphs, but uh, you'll see a lot of talk about CDC. Uh, CDC is a type of feather. I really like Trout Hunter. It's exp It's it's. I mean, it's not crazy expensive, but it's it's more expensive. But you get what you pay for. Um, these are the densest feathers that I have seen when it comes to CDC. It's the best quality CDC. I really don't like using any other um, CDC unless it's it's Trout Hunter stuff. Th this stuff is – this is good shit right here. Um, so CDC is one of those things where you'll you'll constantly see it in – in fly patterns and stuff, but you're not really sure what the hell that stuff is. And, um, it's just, it's a type of soft feather. Uh, the cool thing about CDC is the nature of it. And what it does is it, it, it tends to collect little air bubbles, um, into the, the fibers when it's underwater. Uh, and it does make for a very interesting, um, presentation in the way that it rides in the water. Uh, you could use it up top when you're tying like something like an elk hair caddis and you could put it underneath, um, the, the deer hair before you mount it. And it gives this really buggy, um, brush back look. Uh, and then another way of doing it is, uh, when you have a feather like this and you want to do it around a collar for, uh, something like a nymph, um, what you would do is you would grab the tip of the feather and you would rake everything back behind. See how it straightens out? And then I grab the tip over here and I'll separate it and I have – I got that that V. And that's your tie-in point. So when you, when you go to, to tie it onto your hook shank, you tie it in by that tip. Do a bunch of wraps to secure it. Clip off the, the junk that's up towards the front so it's not all around the front. And then what you're going to do is you're going to take the CDC and, and hold it upwards. And as you wrap it around the hook, you're going to rake back the fibers with every turn. So you're going to grab the – and you're going to rake them back on both sides of the spine and you're going to rake down and you're going to pull it back again and wrap around, rake it back again. And as you're grooming this feather, you're making it do like a full 360 around the hook shank and you get a CDC collar. So what does that mean? Um, that means more movement in the water. F fish love movement. 
they they like stuff that entices them. It really it really drives them wild. That's what you want is something that's going to be lifelike and give a lot of movement. It doesn't mean that it's going to work every single time, but it is another option that you're going to have in your fly selection that when it's the time to see if if that's going to do the trick, you want to tie on a fly that's got more movement and gives a buggier appearance and stuff like that. Um, having what they call soft hackle uh, flies, soft collar, soft collars, um, that's that that's that movement that it does in the water. If you dunk it in water and pull on it with a line on it, you could actually observe the stuff yourself, uh, which is also really good to do um, is to check your check your flies and see what they look like when they're wet. Um, they, they'll look one way after you tie them, but what happens when they go under the water is really what matters. Uh, and, and so I think it's really good to, to, uh, swim, they call it swimming your flies because you want to see what's going on and how, uh, different materials react with one another. Uh, Greg Senyo, he's one of my favorite tires of all time. Uh, he ties, uh, really wild intruders. He's a pioneer when it comes to, uh, using, uh, you know, modern synthetic, uh, materials and stuff. And I remember that was one of his super big, um, words of advice was to swim your flies because you need to see how the materials interact with one another. They may look great when they're, <laughs> they may look great in the vice when they're home, but who knows how the hell that stuff's going to play out when it's under the water and in a current. Uh, it's going to be completely different. It's going to look totally different. So you should also see how that stuff turns out when it's wet and it out of just curiosity. It's really just fascinating to watch. Um, so CDC in I and I'm one of those suckers where I got to have every fucking color under the sun. I have to. I just I got to. And the reason why I like to have every color, uh, and I said this before in my last video, I don't like to be limited. I like to have whatever pops in my head, I like to be able to bring that to life. So if I have an idea or a color combination pattern or whatever, um, I don't want to fall short when I look in my material drawer and find out that that yellow, I'm shit out of luck. That sucks. And, uh, and this is that black hole that fly tires, uh, tend to fall into. They tend to, they tend to hoard materials and constantly buy and buy and buy because it is never enough. Um, every single material you get, you're going to want every single color under the sun. That's, that's just the way that it goes. It's like an artist that wants every uh, color of paint. There's nothing wrong with that. It's 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 good for you. I, fly time. It's a, it's it's something that you love to do. What's so wrong about that? There's worse things that you could be doing. But in the beginning, when you're first starting out, and or you're the type of guy that don't really give a shit about having every color under the sun. There's a lot of like. There's a lot of basic guys there that just ah oh, fucking. I just you know I keep it to a minimum. I keep it simple, and that's fine too. Uh, you do whatever you want to do. Uh, some guys don't need much. Some guy, a lot of guys need all of it. Uh, believe, believe me. Uh, there's a lot more of the hoarders than the minimalists. Um, but you know, I like to have a variety of colors because it doesn't limit me. Uh, that's my personal opinion about, uh, the, the colors and my approach. Um, so CDC, if you do want to break it down to basic colors or important colors, uh, again, go back to what I said about the thread. You're going to want something like a black, a brown, um, a chartreuse, an olive, uh, and then you could really and, – and a dun. You want like a gray if you're doing like a soft hackles and stuff like that. Uh, you could get away with just a few packs, but make sure that you got the colors that really are uh, very common that keep coming up in a lot of patterns and stuff because it will it'll get you through a lot. Uh, so Trout Hunter CDC, uh, bar none, best stuff ever. And you get a ton of it in here too, really, for, for the price. You pay a little bit more, but you get more. Um, any questions about CDC? What's going on, guys? Hey, Stacy, Sandra, what's up? April, what's going on? Cheyenne, miss you. Hope you're doing good. Uncle Brad, how's it going? 
Good to see you guys. Um, any questions at all so far? If not, I'll keep moving on. And thanks for thanks for coming in and joining. Uh, I hope that this is interesting for people that don't even um, fly fish. Uh, I'm explaining it for everybody, uh, so it doesn't matter if you fly fish before. You're starting out. Uh, you've been doing this for you know 30 years, and you're an expert. It doesn't it doesn't matter. I, I'm doing this for for really everybody. I don't really want fly fishing to be some sort of mystery to people. Um, or, or think that it's some sort of magic. It's, I mean, it's magical to me in some senses, but it's not, <laughs> it, it's, uh, it, there's, it, it sounds, it looks complicated. It sounds like there's a lot of, there's a lot of shit to learn. Um, but you know what? You could start off pretty easy, uh, in the beginning and you don't really need to go too crazy. So there's two avenues to take with that. Um, so if you don't have any questions about CDC or hackles, um, the, the next big thing, and this is really my jam is dubbing, <laughs> dubbing, 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 dubbing is God damn. I use it on everything. Um, dubbing is a material. Dubbing is a, is a very fine fur like dusty material. If you could see that well, and what you do is you grab a clump of the stuff and you're going to grab uh, a little bit and you take that piece and you grab a little tiny bit more and then you actually twist it onto the thread uh, and make like a noodle. And when you twist it onto the thread and you form this, this tapered uh, noodle, it's going to start thin, it's going to widen and it's going to get thin again. Um, as you wrap it around the hook shank, uh, it builds bodies. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of guys that go, well, what the hell dubbing do I use for dry flies or nymphs or anything like that? There's a lot of different materials that make up dubbing. There's seal fur, there's rabbit, there's, uh, there's so many. Um, it all really depends, but you could kind of bullshit your way with a lot with a lot of them and uh, you're not really going to have too much trouble. The thing with the dry flies is there are dubbings that are meant more to float on top, especially stuff that's called super fine dubbing. What it does is when you when you dub it onto the onto the thread and you wrap it up the body, um, it ends up being a very tight um, body wrap uh, and it, it doesn't give you a buggy appearance. Uh, and those, the super fine dubbings are usually ones that you use on dry flies and stuff like that because it's a very, it's a very tight tapered body and then you got the hackle and stuff. Um, nymphs on the other hand, and again, those are the guys that go under the water. Um, the nymphs tend to do really well when they're really buggy. Uh, I like really spiky buggy dubbing. Um, one of the dubbing, uh, one of the dubbings that I like to use a lot is made by a brand called SLF. It's Synthetic Living Fibers, um, and it's and uh, their brand makes squirrel dubbing. And this stuff is it, I, now I put it in my own compartment. This is my own thing, and I'll take it out of the package and I'll and I'll uh, fill the compartments and stuff like that because I like to be able to just grab clumps of it as I'm working instead of ripping open little uh, Ziploc bags. So. Uh, SLF synthetic living fibers, they make awesome dubbing that's spiky and buggy as shit. Uh, I, I love that stuff. So if you want to start off with, uh, your first dubbing compartments and stuff like that, try to look for the dubbing boxes that come in like a set of 12 and it'll give you 12 different colors. And depending on the material, uh, of what you want to get, just try to try to go for the natural stuff at first because the synthetic materials of dubbing tend to be a real pain in the ass when you're trying to wrap it onto the noodle. Uh, and, and as you're putting it and as you're dubbing it onto the thread, uh, the synthetics tend to have really long fibers and they're not as wispy and they're, they, they're kind of slick. And as you're trying to twist that onto the thread, they tend to slide over each other and you can't get like a stable noodle. Um, and there's ways of, of taking care of that and, and finding out how to control that stuff um, later. But when you first start off, 
I would probably do uh, like a hare, uh, like a rabbit, rabbit dubbing, uh, or squirrel, uh, and I, I think that that's really that's really the way to go in the very beginning. Uh, Diane, how's it going? Uh, very informative to me. Don't fish, but like to tie for my husband. Nice. Well, that's really sweet of you. Uh, I have a lot to learn past beginner stage, though. Um, that's pretty cool that you tie for your husband. That's awesome. That's very sweet of you to do. He's a lucky one. Um, yeah. So, yeah, in the beginning, Diane, I would definitely, uh, hey, Katerina. Uh, I would definitely recommend uh, getting a dubbing compartment with like the 12 of them. If you go into the fly shop too, I don't know what's around uh, everybody. Some people, uh, they always say support fly shops, support fly shops. Absolutely, support your fly, local fly shops. Some people don't have that option. Some people live in really remote areas and some states don't even have a fly shop. So, you know, before we rip their heads off online about, you know, assuming they're not uh, supporting their fly shops, um, some guys, ha the only option that they can is to order online. That's okay. Uh, don't give people grief because you don't really know what their situation is. They might be out in the middle of the sticks, you know, and, and there's no fly shop in that state. They're not driving eight hours every time they need to pick up a bag of dubbing. So... If, if you go into your fly shop, there's going to be different selections of this stuff. And if you go online, I would search um, I would search assortment dubbings and it will come up and you'll see compartment stuff like this. And it's usually like 12, 13 bucks. Um, and that's going to give you plenty of dubbing for a while in the beginning. I mean, in the very beginning, you're going to be using probably barely any for a long time. It, the little goes a long way with this stuff. This lasts a long time. So squirrel. And rabbit is what I would start off with in the beginning. Um, and then after that, you'll learn the ins and outs of all the other stuff that is too complex and too vast to get into when people are just trying to understand what the hell this stuff is. It's just not really important to get into it all. It confuses people. Um so I'm trying to I'm trying to do this so that everybody can understand and start off on a right foot. Um, we could geek out about it any day on another thing, but on this one, on on these videos, I wanna I wanna get the the tires started off on a foot that's not going to really fry their brains too much. Um, so those are so those are your options when it comes to dubbing. Uh, later on, you're going to find that dubbing is. Jesus, I mean, I I can't walk out of a fly shop without grabbing every goddamn color under the sun in every sort of sparkle, in every sort of color, uh, in every different kind of, you know, this is laser dubbing and, the, you know, this shit's got, you know, holographic tinsel shit in it and, uh, you know, it, it's, there's, it, there's billions of them and I am, I am a dubbing hoarder. I will fess up. I am horrible with this stuff. Uh, so I would be a hypocrite to tell you guys to to uh, keep it simple when it comes to dubbing. It's cheap. Fucking $2 for a fucking bag of it. I just go crazy. So when I'm in the fly shop and I'm like, ooh, I didn't see that color before. And I, yeah, I just can't walk out with more dubbing. Yeah, I, I got to have it. Um, so... The other type of dubbing that I'm going to get into uh, before I move on to something else um, is there is a synthetic or synthetic blend called ice dubbing. Ice dubbing is different. It's made by Hairline. Um, it is different than regular dubbing because it does have these shimmering holographic fibers in there. Um, and it does kind of look like, like sparkling melty icicles. They, it kind of looks like tinsel on a Christmas tree. Um, and they come in all different colors. This one's peacock, really good color to have. That's a very, very common thing. Um, ice dubbing's really cool. And you could also blend it and mix it with naturals if you want. Um, and I'm going to show you real quick, actually, now that I, now that I'm talking about it is, uh, how do you blend colors together on dubbing? Um, what you're going to do is you're going if you're if you are finding yourself 
in uh, in an artist kind of mentality, and you do have dubbings, but you're not really quite sure um, if if that color fits the bill, and all the other colors aren't really quite it, but you kind of needed an in between. You have an orange, and you have a yellow. But the yellow is too strong in intensity and the orange is too strong and you kind of wanted a little bit more of a subtle of each. Um, th this, uh, My advantage on this is that I was a professional uh, artist and oil painter for all of my 20s. So when it comes to color, um, it's, it's really instinctual to me at this point. But when I want to blend – hey, Jordy. Um, when I want to blend colors together – um, this is how I do it. So I'm going to grab a clump. I'm going to grab a clump of, of what I want. And it's always to go a little bit more than too little. You never know how much you're going to use, right? So you grab, you grab a clump like this of the yellow. You're going to grab a clump of the orange, right? And the, both of them are kind of really, both of them are kind of really bright. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to take the one, I'm going to stack the orange on top of that. Let me see if I can get closer. And what I do is I'll, I'll grab the two piles and rip it, put it on top, rip it, put it on top, rip it, put it on top, rip it. And as I'm doing this sh card shuffle of, of hair, uh, it ends up blending together to form a not so intense kind of warm orange uh, because I added a yellow and a very intense orange and it kind of gives you kind of get oh, the the light is kind of weird but uh, since I blended those two colors together it's going to give you a deader orange it's going to give you a more natural looking orange so when you're when you want to mix a color that you don't that you don't have, um, but you're able to combine them. That's how you mix the dubbings together to get the color that you want if you don't have it. And uh, this is also an advantage for uh, customizing the, your dubbings. Uh, you can make whatever the hell color you want, and then your flies are going to become really yours. And this is, again, one of those things that don't limit you in any way. You're able to let the creative side of you just kind of go wild and if that's the color you want and that's the color that you make uh so that's how you uh that's how you blend dubbings together and when it comes to the ice dubbing like i said it's a synthetic the fibers are going to be a little bit longer but if i blend those with natural it kind of really gives its own look to it on you know in another way it's it's, it's a little bit of both uh and when you don't want all the flashy flash but you want a little touch of it, that's when I would mix it with an equivalent that's a natural, like a like a rabbit hair or squirrel. And I'll do, you know, let's say that it's peacock and it's got that, that green. Then when I go to the natural dubbing, I would also find a green that's roughly around that color. And when I mix them together, I'll still stay in that area, but I'll get that, that flash that I want, but it's not overpowering, right? Any questions about dubbing colors? Does anyone have questions about color? Mixing, dubbing, and stuff like that? Is, is, is there any question about material interactions or anything like that? If not, I'll, I'll move on to the next thing. All right. So that's that's the scoop with dubbing. Dubbing, I, I can never have enough. Ever. And in nymphs, it's used all the time for bodies. Um, so after dubbing, um, there is – you're also going to find a lot of stuff about deer hair. Uh, you'll see a lot of patterns for like elk hair caddises and all that stuff. Uh that is not an easy material to have control of in the very beginning. Uh, not bad to have, but it is also just this. These are different types of elk and deer hair, and they all are kind of the same, and they're all kind of different. Uh, <laughs> what I mean by that is um, there's going to be certain hairs that are there's going to be certain hairs that are more user friendly, and there's going to be ones that are coarser. Uh, 
So you see, that's that's what I'm talking about. And really what you would do is you'd grab a clump of that, and I'll get into that in another video, but really what it's, it, it is, it's a very they, – they, they are – it's a thick material for um, – comparative to other materials that you're mounting on top of the hook. So um, with that being said, when you're selecting this stuff, the softer softer deer hairs uh, and elk hairs, uh, they help you a lot when you're, when you're uh, cinching down the materials onto your hook shank um, and don't really fight with you too much when it comes to the thread tension. Uh, a lot of guys have trouble when they, when they wrap the thread around the deer hair. Um, it, they find that the deer hair keeps rotating with the torque of the thread. And as they're cinching it down, the fucking shit doesn't stay still and it drives you nuts. And, and then you end up snapping your thread and then the fucking deer hair falls everywhere and then you start cursing and so, <laughs> so this is the way it goes um so when it comes to stuff like that uh when when you are uh finding deer hair try to keep it simple in the beginning just get a patch or two uh, of it if you're just starting off you're probably not going to fool around with this stuff too much in the beginning you'll get to this stuff later um but this is good to, it's good to have in the very beginning i would grab like one or two of these and uh feel them for yourselves and and find the ones the softer ones are a little easier to manage then again the coarser ones they're they're meant for different things so um you know deer hair is a common material that you're going to see uh, when you're looking for uh, beginning uh, selections, but really even one of these is going to do you good for a long time. You don't need much, um, but they're used for like elk hair, caddises, and dry flies. That they they, they are real. The great thing about deer hair is that it is it's super buggy, really buggy, and when it sits on top of the water like that, and I'm going to give you the 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 perspective of the fish. You know, when they're looking, pretend you're the fish and you're looking up at it as if this was floating on top of the water and this is the belly. You know, the, the fish will interpret that as, as a caddis fly uh, and they will, it, it, it will give the silhouette of wings and it really does top water, elk hair caddis flies are, in my book, they're essential. You got to have them. If there's a dry fly that you got to have. It's an elk hair caddis. Um, you'll catch wild brookies on that shit. You'll catch, uh, you know, really. Uh, so deer hair, you should have it in the beginning. Um, and and if the if the pattern is too complicated uh, or a little too difficult to handle the materials at first, um, set it aside. Work on other uh, patterns that that are a little bit more user friendly at first, and then come back to it. And when you come back to it, you're going to realize that every time you do it, it's a little bit easier to manage because your experience grows. Uh, so do you guys have any questions about deer hair? If you got a lot of them around you, shoot them. <laughs> That'll get you a lot of material real quick. I think one deer will last you your whole life. Otherwise, you get them at a fly shop or online. Um... So moving on from deer hair is going to be uh, one of my favorite materials to play with is a material called marabou. Uh, these, these feathers are not for nymphs and they're not for dries. Uh, these feathers are used for what we call streamers. So streamers are going to be really big flies that um, are used for salmon and steelhead, and uh, you're also going to find them used for uh, for woolly buggers and stuff like that, which are for trout too. Um, and it's it's this kind of stuff. Ooh, ah. Uh. <laughs> so this is this is one of mine. It's called the Fisher Flame. Uh, this is a mix of uh, red, orange, and then towards the back, it's uh, yellow. And, uh, and then in the front, there's guinea hackle that's wrapped around. That gives that black, uh, that black crest that rakes a little bit back. Um, marabou is now in person when it's dry, it's, it's incredibly soft, like something you would use as a, as a feather duster. Um, when it gets wet, 
uh, that's a whole different thing to observe in person. So like I was talking about earlier, when I tell you to swim your flies, watch the material in the water and see what this stuff does. It dances. It's it's like watching it's like watching a dancer with a dress uh, on a on a on a dance floor. It, it's this it's this swaying, you know, flowing beautiful you know gown of a of a fly. And when this sucker gets wet, I mean, when I'm talking about lifelike movement in the water that entice trout or or salmon or steelhead, whatever the hell fish you're going for, that drives them nuts. Uh, because it's very lifelike. That's the nature of that particular feather. So when it comes to marabou, remember uh, earlier on in the video when I was talking about wrapping CDC, the approach is exactly the same. You would strip, uh, you would strip that that tip, uh, and then you would tie that in, and then you would rake the fibers back as you're wrapping it around. You rake it back, wrap it around, rake it back. That way you're not trapping any fibers as you're wrapping the materials around and you're getting a whole 360 of, of this feather going around the, the hook shank or the, or the tube, depending on what you use. Um, and it's a really, really cool, it's a really, really cool fly, um, and material to use. And the, the possibilities are absolutely endless, endless. You could tie God, I I can't. There are billions of combinations of that stuff. That there's not a fly tire in the world that's cracked them all yet. You know that's the beauty of it. It's like paint for an artist. No one's gonna ever hit a standstill where we go. Well, that's it. Everyone's done everything. Um, the the selection of stuff is unbelievable. Uh, so marabou is going to come in packs like this and. And let me get a little specific when I talk about the, the marabou here. I am very particular about the, the kind of marabou that I get, and I like the spay blood quills. Blood quill marabou. And <laughs> good to see you too, Eddie. Thanks, man. Um, not quite painting, but it's it's you'll find a lot of similarities, Eddie, I'm 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 sure. Um, so when it comes to blood quill marabou. Uh, what I'm talking about is that uh, the, a lot of it has to do with the with the tips and the 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 length of the fibers. They really there's nothing quite like it. When you take out the other types of marabou, they're shorter. They're kind of uh, shittier. I don't know how else to say it. Um, and the blood quills is really what you want for streamers. This this stuff is is awesome. Um, so marabou, every color under the sun too. I mean, I'm, I'm a sucker with that shit. So I will take every color imaginable if I can. And they're only like $4 and change a bag. Not that bad. Go blow your money. <laughs> Reese, love that stuff in articulated streamers. Hell yeah, dude. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, articulated streamers would, yeah, I mean that, that's also another thing. I mean, uh, so articulate for the guys that don't know what the hell we're talking about. Articulated means that there's that there's sections uh, that move freely uh, instead of a fixed shank that that's just a hook. Uh, when it's articulated, there's sections of spine uh, that move independently. So uh, you the whole thing shimmers, the whole body moves. Uh, it's not a, a fixed straight shank. It, the whole thing moves like a chain, like a chain links. Uh, and then the hook is is on the back of that. That's what articulated is. So uh, some guys will tie stuff called game changers and shit like that. Uh, those are articulated. Uh, so yeah, so the marabou, you could go nuts. Do I find this essential in the beginning? If you're in an area that you're going for like salmon and steelhead and big fish, uh, yeah, yeah, I would probably load up on marabou. I would get marabou, and if, if that's what you're deciding to zero in on in the beginning. If you're learning streamers first, learn streamers first. Uh, you know, it, and you want to know the advantage of learning how to tie streamers early on, too? They're big, and when you're working on big flies, it's more forgiving than if you were working on a fly that's the size of your, you know, your pinky nail. Uh, it, bigger flies are easier to handle. It, it, it's more forgiving to the people early on uh, that really don't have uh, that really delicate control 
of materials and thread control and uh, all that stuff. So big flies uh, are always recommended to people that are just starting out because it's uh, much easier to handle. You could also use heavier threads and stuff like that too that don't break as easily because you're using a larger fly. So uh, if you are starting off, um, streamers is not a bad idea to, to start tying. Um, and the probably the first one that a lot of people are going to tell you to try to tie is uh, a woolly bugger. Um, a woolly bugger is a, another, like I told you about the elk hair caddis, that's hold on a minute all right that was interrupted uh like i was talking about with the elk hair caddis as a dry fly being uh an essential for for uh, dry fly fishing again it's the little guys that float on top of the water um a woolly bugger is the fly to have when it comes to being under the water uh woolly buggers if if there was a if there was a thing where you could load your fly box with with only five flies, uh, and and you had to pick which ones, the woolly buggers in there. Top three, it probably still is in there. That's how that's how critical a, a bugger is. You you gotta have them. So if that's the case, um, marabou is used for the tail. It's used for the butt, um, and then you have hackle it up the body, and you have chenille and stuff like that. And you'll see that in other videos. I'm not going to get too much into it. Y you guys will know what a woolly bugger is. Um, so, uh, marabou is used for that too. So, uh, do I find it an essential material in the very beginning? I'd probably say so. Yeah. Um, and again, with the color, you could just go ape shit with this stuff. Every color under the sun. I love to have it because I don't like to feel limited. Other guys don't give a shit about that. They're fine with very little. That's okay, too. Uh, I'm just talking about me. Uh, so, uh, so, so Marabou Selection, uh, and there's different brands and stuff like that. Really, again, try to look for the Blood Quill Marabou. Um, and then you're going to find, like, um, you're going to find every color under the sun when it comes to that stuff. And some of them are even, um, some of them are even patterned and uh, what they call barred which is uh, you get like these little alternating black strips that go down it. Um, for example, this is Chickaboo. It's a smaller type of Marabou, but you see what I'm talking about? That kind of shit. So they're usually a little bit more expensive, but that stuff is, and Chickaboo is also a really great stuff. Chickahoo? Chickaboo. Um, this stuff is good for really uh, little, little things. Um, and the last thing that I want to touch on before I, before I wrap it up here is, uh, substituting. Um, this is a really big issue in the beginning of, uh, learning how to tie because a lot of guys that just started tying are really unsure if they're able to use another material, uh, if they don't have the material that the recipe calls for. The short answer is Yes. Yes, you can substitute materials. Uh, you're you're not going to have every material under the sun uh, to do this stuff. You are going to have to substitute. I still substitute with stuff. Some because of a price point. Some because it's a rarity. Some because it's, uh, you know, I don't have it. It all really depends. But substitution is critical. And I'm going to give you an example uh, of, of one of them in particular. Now, you probably heard or are going to hear about something called wood duck. Um, and wood duck is used in a lot of traditional patterns, especially uh, Catskill uh, dry flies. You're gonna see you're gonna see that stuff a lot in, in a, they use them for tails, they use them for um, uh, for wing casing. They use it for all sorts of stuff. Uh, the beautiful thing about wood duck is the, speckling that's on them and I'm going to try I hope that this I hope that this comes through very easily but let me see if I could take one out and I'll show you but when it comes to material substitution first of all wood duck is getting harder and harder to find for a lot of reasons that I'm not going to get into right now but you see the speckling and the fine, 
ultra fine tips that are on there. There is nothing that imitates a mayfly's tail better than that. It's perfect. There, it's also just a, it's a beautiful feather. It's absolutely gorgeous when you see it in person. This doesn't really do it justice, but when you see it in person, they're gorgeous. They're hard to find. They're expensive. You're only getting a few feathers for like seven dollars in a pack. They are expensive and they're harder to harder and harder to find. So. If you are having trouble finding them and the recipe is calling for wood duck and you go, oh shit, I don't have it. What am I going to do? That's the one material I don't have. I can't make it. Shit. Uh, no, 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 no. When I say that there's a substitution, it's not going to be a complete um, perfect match, but there's stuff that's close. That's what a substitute is. Um, I will use mallard flank dyed in wood duck. Uh, to mimic the color. The pros and cons to, to this stuff is that the speckling is not as perfect. The material, you're going to have to pick through a lot of junk in the pack to get the, the, you know, the ones that you really want. When it comes to the real wood duck, usually every feather counts. This, uh, not so much. You kind of have to weed through the, the garbage and pick out the good ones. But, uh, you know, for $3 and a quarter... And for the amount that you get in here, if that's all you can do, or if that's, you know, a price point that works for you, substitute. Um, it, really, substituting is okay. It's encouraged. It, it, it's part of fly tying. Um, it, even other materials like dubbing. Let's say that you have a type of dubbing and, and it called for this type of dubbing. Just find something similar and, and it looks right. Use it. Uh, it, you'll be fine, and I'm sure that the f the fly will catch fish anyways. Just as as long as you you tie it well, uh, and and make it look what it's supposed to look like uh, to you and the fish. Um, substitute it with whatever you think. Maybe later on you'll find out that maybe something worked better or whatever. But um, you know you're gonna find certain substitutes work. Um, you know it's the same thing with soft tackles. Remember I was talking about CDC. Um, you know, if you want to do a soft hackle collar, but you don't have CDC, uh, you could still do a soft hackle collar with, with, with even hen saddle. It's not going to be the same look as the CDC per se, but you could still do a soft hackle collar. Uh, if that's what you got, try to fi figure it out. This is how these flies become your own is, is doing stuff like that. You might actually use another material in place of something else. And then that pattern all of a sudden starts to take on a life of its own, and then you start changing other things about it, and now those flies are now your design. They're not someone else's. So really, it, it's encouraged in a creative uh, aspect too. Uh, it allows you to start thinking for yourself. Guidelines are good. Books are good. Recipes are good. But just like cooking, you're going to get to a point in the kitchen where you're like, you know what? The chili's good, but I kind of like it a little spicier. So you throw in whatever the hell you want or, you know, you play with stuff or and that's how, the, you know, that's how mom's recipe uh, happened <laughs> because she probably made it her own and it makes it, you know, specifically hers. And that's why it was so I got to get that recipe. It, it, nothing tastes like mom's because it became hers. Same thing with the flies. It's going to become yours the more you dick around with it. Fool around with it. Change the materials. See what works. See what doesn't. Experiment. Fuck it. Who cares? Um, that's the that's the beauty of, of fly tying. Not to just copy and mimic everybody. Uh, you know, it, this is a creative work area right here that you're doing. And, and have the most important thing about fly tying, if you find yourself getting frustrated, is... To find the joy in fly tying. I cannot stress that enough. Find the joy in it. Because if you don't find the stuff that makes you happy, you're going to hate it. And I had experience like that in my past when it came to painting. And, um, I, and I find as I've gotten older, it's really important to just have fun with it and to play and to create and um, sometimes that that all that other shit doesn't matter as long as you're enjoying what you're doing, uh, and 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 finding new things to explore and to to play with. Uh, that's gonna keep your motivation going. 
Um, if you keep beating a dead horse and you keep doing the same mundane shit over and over again, you're not going to want to sit down and tie because it's, it's getting to the point of it's not really expanding your creativeness or whatever. So when it comes to substituting materials, that's part of the creativeness. That's what allows you to kind of let yourself take off and become your own tire uh, or, or your own artist, uh, you know, for people that paint or draw, same thing. It, it allows the, it allows you to get, but learn the rules before you break them. But if, if you want to play around, fuck it, play around. Um, I, I like to do that a lot, especially if I'm done doing a lot of orders for people and I've been hunched over the vice for days, cranking this stuff out. And after I'm done, I don't even want to fucking look at it anymore. I, I want to do anything that wasn't what I was just doing. So, I mean, if I had to tie, you know, uh, two, two, three dozen elk hair caddises, I don't want to look at an elk hair caddis anymore. Dear God, I want to do something that's the total opposite of an elk hair caddis. I would probably break up the monotony by playing around with some wild streamer just to break up that 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 mundane, you know, aspect of it at times. And, and this is the kind of stuff that I would just play with, play with the colors experiment. It kind of revitalizes your, uh, your, your motivation and drive behind it. It makes you want to sit down again. Um, so that's uh, – substituting materials is very, very good to do and you'll learn as you go. I can't really go through all of it, but it is 100% OK to substitute materials. And don't let anyone tell you otherwise. That's a load of bullshit. Substitute. Make do with what you got. If you don't have it, it's fine. All right? Um, is there any questions before I sign off for the night? I hope I touched on everything and I made it not boring. Is there any questions that you guys have? Even about not materials or, or material substitutions? Anything about fly fishing at all that you're kind of, you don't know what, what, what it's about? I could answer them before I go. Do you prefer synthetic or natural materials? I kind of like both. Um, there's, there's, there's guys that are a little bit more particular about the naturals and they're more of the, the purists. Which are, that's fine too. Uh, you know, you've been doing it years enough. If, if that's the direction that you went and that's really what, what you think works for you, there's a lot of guys that, that really just stick to the natural stuff. Um, the guys that are more modern and kind of keep up with the times and are willing to explore uh, new materials that get introduced to the industry, um, you know, those are the guys that end up pushing boundaries and changing you know, changing things, um, you know, for the better. So for me, I like both for different reasons. There's some synthetic materials out there that are just essential. And they're also just fucking wild crystal flash. I mean, that stuff, that stuff is, that's beautiful shit. You know, I have, you know, flashaboo. I mean, this stuff drives fish nuts too. I, synthetic materials to me are just as important as the natural. Um, so do I prefer one or the other? No, not at all. I, I love them both. I, I love to, ex to experiment and to play with shit. So, uh, the, the, the more stuff, the better, the newer, the stuff I'll play with it. Sure. And I'll let you know if I hate it or, or it's good, uh, you know, but, uh, send, yeah, throw it my way. Um, Reese package leaders or building your own. Hmm. Uh, if you have the time to build your own leaders, uh, and you find that it's a money saver, uh, I would have to say, uh, go for it. Um, it, usually it's, uh, usually you buy Maxima. It's a, that's a type of, um, that's a type of, of line and, uh, you would do, uh, different, uh, different diameters and section them off and, and you would blood knot them together until it tapers down thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner and until you get to your fly. Um, the disadvantages of that stuff is that you, you got those little lumps, um, but it depends on what bothers you really. Um, building your own leaders, I mean, 
I build my own on certain ones. Um, Euro leaders and stuff like that. Uh, so it, when it comes to package leaders, uh, here's the thing about package leaders. I would really recommend, and this is something that someone recommended to me in the early stages, is do not waste your money buying fluorocarbon um, leaders. Uh, don't, 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 don't. And I'm going to tell you why. Um, package leaders, just get the regular nylon uh, leaders um, because the fish are not really necessarily going to be interacting that close with the majority of the leader. Um, so if you're worried about uh, light refraction in the water, um, the material that I would – that's part of your leader that I really would change to fluorocarbon is your tippet. Your tippet is your last two, three feet of leader. And that I would uh, I would do fluorocarbon so it disappears where it's needed most, which is near the fly. Um, when it's two three feet away from the fly, that leader ain't gonna fucking matter. I do do the do the nylon for for the leader. Um, so package leaders, if you're doing it smart, uh, I would I get package leaders because they come in like sets of three, sets of six. Um, and it's, it's definitely more price friendly in that regard, but building your own is also price friendly. Depends really what your motive is. Um, but if you buy package leaders, I would highly recommend, uh, installing a tippet ring, uh, between your leader and your tippet so that when the tippet breaks, um, it's going to break at the tippet ring and you're never going to lose parts of your leader. If you continue to do that, uh, by by just surgeons knotting it together, you're going to end up eating through a lot of leader, and then a uh, price point does become a concern. So um, both kind of have their pros and the cons. I think both is good. I think it's good to learn how to build your own too, for sure. Any other questions for you guys? Anything else before I sign off for the night? All right, so thanks a lot for joining tonight. I know that this was maybe a little bit longer than I expected, but eh, it's, who cares? Uh, so you could always, you know, skim through it and, you know, listen to whatever you want. Uh, so thanks a lot for joining in. Uh, it was really good to see you guys and see new faces too. That's kind of cool. Uh, and I will probably do one tomorrow as well, if not the day after. Um, but I pro I'm trying to do them every night. Uh, so join me tomorrow. I'll probably do them around the same time, nine o'clock. Uh, and again, my name's Scott Fisher. I, um, I fly under the banner of Fisher Flyworks, which is my company. Uh, you could find me on Etsy and you could also find Fisher Flyworks on YouTube. I'm going to move this video over to YouTube, uh, and just type in Fisher Flyworks in the search bar and it'll come up, subscribe to it, like it, share the crap out of it. Uh, all of it helps. And uh, hopefully I will, uh, I will see you guys again soon. And thanks for stopping by. Hope you learned a lot. Hope it wasn't too boring. See you later.